Welcome to Cravings Control for Fat Loss. I'm your host, Laura Caballo, former sugar binger, overeater, and yo-yo dieter turned fat loss and cravings coach for hundreds of busy women. Here at Cravings Control for Fat Loss, I'll be sharing mindset, movement, and metabolism strategies for those who are ready to ditch the fat diet cycle and slim down without counting calories, tracking points, or giving up any of the foods they love. Get ready to embrace progress over perfection, grace over guilt, and bring curiosity and learning to the inevitable ups and downs of your life. Expect a decrease in your cravings while seeing and feeling an improvement in how you look, how you feel, and your overall quality of life. I am so excited you're here, boo. Let's get started. In today's episode, I speak with Megan Coppell Duffy, a Pilates teacher and movement professional that specializes in brain-based movement for people with neurological conditions, chronic pain, and sports-specific training. She's the co-founder of The Neuro Studio, which is an education platform for movement professionals to learn the cutting-edge techniques that she's developed. She also has an online platform for patients living with neurological conditions to get the same quality movement at a more affordable price. She's been teaching Pilates and working with people for nearly 22 years at this point. In today's episode, we discuss who specifically Megan works with, what neuro issues look and feel like, and her personal story about the neuro connection between her gut and her anxiety. I hope you enjoy the show. Well, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Megan and I connected in a business mentorship earlier this year, and I really think that the type of work you do is so important and meaningful and powerful and can really empower people that are maybe disadvantaged or in this bracket of of people that maybe fitness and health isn't so accessible to them, right? It gives them an avenue to to move their bodies, to to get better, to to improve their life. Yeah. And so Megan, um, well, I'll let you share exactly what you do and, and tell us a little bit about, um, your business and your company, and then we'll kind of get into your background. Awesome. So I am one of the co-founders of the neuro studio and it's a platform. It's got kind of two legs. The first leg is we teach other movement pros how to get people with neurological conditions moving better with, up-to-date techniques that actually help. Um, And the other leg is we work with people with neurological conditions, getting them moving again. Stroke, brain injury, Parkinson's, um, neurodivergence, sensory issues, all those things. And really my big overarching thing is making movement individualized based off each person's brain's unique response. So Laura, I always Mm -hmm. say everybody's a neuro client. Not everybody has a neurological condition. So what was interesting about your podcast for me, diet, nutrition is is not my thing, but there is a lot of crossover neurologically. So I'm just kind of excited to talk about that with you, with your expertise and, you know, maybe have a little fun, maybe a little bit, not too much now. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) you can't have any fun. No fun will be had. No fun. No fun. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to just... I'm curious because when I hear like neuro issues, to your point, you said MS and Alzheimer's, correct? Parkinson's, uh, stroke, brain injury. Okay. CMT. Yeah. Neurodivergence. What is neurodivergence? So, you know, uh, people are more familiar with like autism, right? And autism is a spectrum. So how we look at and how I look at it as everybody's brain is unique. So there's people who might not be autistic, but their brain works a little bit differently. So there's some people who might not connect to emotions or some people have major sensory issues or minor sensory issues. So we think of like someone who was considered autistic one end. So they might have a lot of sensory issues. They can't wear certain things, can't hear certain things, um, lights, Mm. different things like that or their brain just processes things differently. So even if you have any experience knowing anybody with autism, there is a spectrum there. No brain is unique. And where my research and the work I do, really where I'm going as well, is talking about people who don't have extreme neurological conditions, 
but might have some sensory issues that could lead to things like anxiety, depression, overeating, having trouble losing weight, having trouble gaining weight, um, because it is all connected. So Mm-hmm. I think I love this work because I'm curious. I love getting to know people. That's kind of how you me and too. I bonded in the uh, legacy. Yeah. We just got to talk. Yeah. Tell me everything. My husband's always like, yes. why are you interrogating people? I am so <laughs> curious. It's like, why is that? You know, when just people do things, I'm always like, why are they doing it that way? Like, um, yes. I've been, I've been called the Larry David of the movement world. Um, <laughs> and it's not that I'm grumpy. I'm just, it's like, I can't believe they're doing it that way. I need to learn more. And usually there's always a reason why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those reasons help people understand who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. That's really fascinating. That's really fascinating. So when we're talking neuro, are we talking electrical impulses? Are we talking things that are affecting the central nervous system? Everything. So our brain is kind of central command. You know, you'll hear people talk about how their nervous system is fine. People will do cold baths or they'll do all different things to shift their nervous system. You know, a cold bath or a plunge is great. But like my question is, yo, why is everybody cold plunging every freaking day? Why do you have to do a hard reset on your nervous system? I think we need to talk about that. Um, from a weight loss perspective, I have a lot of clients with hypermobility. And when you have hypermobility, you often have a lack of sensation in muscles, especially in a stretch reflex. And I do have a lot of hypermobile clients who also have weight problems, have had Mm. gastric bypass, have been on every diet and can't lose the weight because our stomach works neurologically via a stretch reflex. I hear you talking about the status, it's status full. full. So it's like, when we think about being full, there is a sensory input So when our stomach fills with fluid or food, it's not like our stomach gets bigger. There's a stretch in the muscle that alerts Mm -hmm. our brain. Yo, you're full. Stop. Which is why, Mm -hmm. I don't know, did your parents like, they're like, you've got to wait 20 minutes before you go in the pool and wait 20 minutes before you have dessert. Because sometimes it takes a minute for everything to get down into the stomach to respond. Now, don't even get me started about hormones and how that can affect the stretch receptors of the stomach. I mean, the Wednesday before my period, I could eat everything in my house because the hormones that are being released in preparation to be pregnant, which I'm not looking to do, you know, there's relaxin and other hormones that make me less responsive to the stretch. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel full until I'm really full. And my hypermobile people get that because they don't feel, they don't feel a muscle contraction until they're at super, super end range. So it's like, we don't feel something until we're getting punched in the face with it. I don't know. Do you ever wow. experience like overeating? Cause you want to feel full. You want to feel something. Yeah. Am I the only one yeah. out there? <laughs> no, no. This is something that, uh, I, I would do a lot before I really started becoming more attuned to my cravings and my hunger and slowing down and looking at things from sort of a macro approach Mm -hmm. instead of a micro approach, like, oh, I'm hungry. I I should be eating instead of asking myself, well, I just ate an hour ago or am I stressed or am I tired or, you know, whatever it might be. So yeah, it's all sensations. And for me, like that is so important. And I love that you talk to people about that. You know, I've talked to some clients who are very religious and it's all different religions. And there's always this constant consumption with food. Like I know people who eat kosher now, I'm not speaking for the Jewish faith. I don't know enough about it, but one of my clients, she uh, taught Hebrew school and she had told me, I knew it wasn't, you don't mix um, meat and cheese. And I thought it was for a different reason. And she said it could be, but it's also to consciously think about what you're eating and putting in your body and being grateful for the abundance or lack thereof. So it's always sometimes it's like going back to the basics of like, what does my body need? What am I craving? And for me, it's also about movement. So Mm -hmm. sometimes when I'm feeling like that, I know that I need to ground myself. Now, some people stand on grass or do things. I need to move and feel sensation in my muscles. Mm. I have celiac, which creates a lot of inflammation in my guts and it affects the sensation of how I feel. 
Um, I didn't get diagnosed with celiac until I was, how old am I, Laura? I'm 41. I think it was 37. And I was wow. shocked at the diagnosis. What's wow. interesting was I was having trouble eating. I was basically, I'd eat a morsel of food and I was so full, like I ate Thanksgiving dinner. Um, everybody was very concerned, except the crazy thing was I was very thin for my body. Um, I felt like I looked gray, but everywhere I went, guess what people would say to me? You look great. Mm -hmm. You look great. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Uh -huh. What are you doing? You look so great. I wasn't eating because I was so full. So I go to the doctor, convinced I have like stomach cancer. It's something serious. They did all these tests, blood test biopsies. And the doctor's like, you're very healthy. You just have celiac. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't. She's like, yeah, you do. She's like, people fight me saying they have celiac. Your blood test is positive. And I'm like, but I eat bread every day and I feel fine. And she's like, and I actually said to the doctor, I'm from New York and New Jersey. I thought this was funny. She's like, what do you want it to be? I'm like, well, can I eat bread if it's stomach cancer? And she did not find that funny. Obviously, no, I didn't want stomach cancer, but yeah. I didn't want to change my whole lifestyle because as we get older, I thought I had a great relationship with food. I ate what I want in smaller portions. I stopped when I was full. I wasn't like that when I was younger. So now she's telling me, you have to be even more wrench mentioned about your food. And I'm a little bit type A. I mean, it's hard to believe I know just listening to me talk. But I didn't want to be obsessed about that. So I didn't want it to be that. So yeah. again, going back to sensory issues, I have a million conversations going on at once. So I'm going to circle back to the sensory. Good. Yeah. I've had sensory issues my whole life, not knowing. Mm -hmm. I hated dance because tights, they come above your belly button. I can't wear pants that come above my belly button. I don't like, like right now, this shirt. Uh, you guys can't see me, but Laura will see me fidgeting. I wear a specific tank top. People joke on Instagram. If you go to my page, I have 10 in white, 10 in black, a few in the colors, but I don't like how the colors feel. I like how the white and black ones feel. So I'm very specific about my clothes. Um, I okay. always was like that. My mom was always like, stop fidgeting. I would always pull away from my clothes. I always felt like I was heavier than I was because any sensation of my skin pressing into my clothes told my brain that I was bigger. So mm -hmm. I did not realize this until I kind of got the celiac diagnosis and my inflammation decreased. And if you look at mm -hmm. pictures of me before the diagnosis, people are like, oh my God, you lost weight. Didn't lose a pound. I'm just less inflamed. So right. I can feel my body in a much different way than I used to. So I can use movement as a tool. And I'm not talking about a hardcore workout. That's what grounds me, calms my anxiety, stops me from overeating. And if I find I'm overeating, it's because I want to feel something. So I'll change the sensory environment. I'll go on my PEMF mat. I will mm -hmm. smell something. I will do something. Um, so again, movement's just one tool. Right. It's not going to be the panacea for everyone. They still got to know what you're talking about. They still got to know how yeah. to create a plate. But yeah. these tools, when you know how to create a plate and you're like, I hear what Laura's saying. Why is this still not working for me? You might not feel full. You might think feeling full is a different sensation. Like one of my clients who overeats, she does not feel full ever. How do you manage yeah. your weight when you never feel full? Yeah. Like I... Yeah feel bad for her, not mm -hmm. pity her. I'm just thinking I know when to stop eating because my stomach feels full. Yeah. Mind blowing. And that, and that can, that can dip into hormones yeah. too, like leptin and, and ghrelin. And yeah, I was just reading about that. It, there's a huge effect on that as well. It's so easy to kind of just pinpoint the hormones and stuff like that. It's our body is just responding to what's coming at it. Or ignoring, right? Oh. Ignoring cues for a long time. Well, I have this big problem with athletes. My husband is a former athlete. Um, I don't consider myself an athlete, even though I play sports. I was like average at best. Don't you love when people like pump up their career? I'm like, I just made the team by the skin of my nose. My husband hey, was it a, counts. It counts. Yeah, it counts. It counts. My husband was a D1 football player. Okay, he's an athlete. He, I had to tell him, you're gonna die working out. What are you doing? Like he was on a Peloton bike. And he looked like he was like not working hard. I walked over. He had the Peloton. It was turned up all the way. I, I, a human couldn't move the pedals. 
And I'm like, you need to like chill, dude. And Mm -hmm. for him, unless he's feeling like he's going to vomit or he's at his edge, he doesn't think that's a workout. This is earlier. He's gotten better about it now, Mm -hmm. but he also has trouble. Uh, He's going to love that I'm talking about him. Um, But like he used to lose and gain like 80 pounds every few years. Yeah. Because it's almost like to be an athlete at his level, you kind of have to turn off those feelings and keep it moving. Yep. And I've, I've had interactions with male athletes like that as well, especially more specifically ones that have now struggle with binging and overeating who had these really big appetites, appetites as athletes, training super hard, pushing their bodies to extremes, eating training table with their, their teammates. And now that they're not athletes anymore, they still carry over some of those appetite uh, habits. Mm -hmm. But in addition, they have not like relinquished that relationship with like pushing your body to extremes. Yeah. And like Brian told me there was like, he was an offensive lineman. So those are kind of like big dudes. If you saw them on the street, you wouldn't like, I joke, the average weight of our wedding party was like 305 pounds and my husband's six, six. So, but these guys were lighter on their feet and better on the dance floor than my bridesmaids who were like average weight, like 120. So they're just kind of freaks. And I mean that in a positive way, but there was like, he was only allowed to have two things from the green pile because they had to watch their weight. Right. Right. So they had to be like 320 pounds, but their body fat couldn't get too high. And in order to be 320 pounds, you got to eat a lot of food. So Mm -hmm. I think there's like good foods and bad foods and they don't know how to manage. And like Brian would tell me like after, like if he, when he wrestled there, he would like binge on like sweets because they weren't allowed to eat it. So right. it's just so interesting. That's why I love when I hear you, um, your social media posts about like, no, like have a, I love you food, have a, you know, you have to have this part of me. I don't know the names of it, but it's like having yeah. a food you love, you know, make your plate enjoyable. Yes. Balance. Cause yeah. that's real life. That's real life. Is that, is that real life? I, balance that's is real. so hard, isn't it? And I always say it's an act, not a destination. It's reality. <laughs> you know? it, not not balance per se, because I think that's hard to come by for a lot of people, especially in America. But more the reality is you're going to have the cookie. You're going to have the cereal. You're going to have the piece of cakes. You just need to decide how it's going to play out in your life. Are you going to restrict it, then binge it or overeat it? Or are you going to learn how to bring it into your diet in addition to other nutrient dense foods that are also going to make you feel really good. Yeah. I don't know so, about you in my twenties. I taught a lot of fitness classes. I definitely over exercised. I remember when I ran um, a marathon, I did only one. I remember one day doing like a 15 mile run and like I came home and ate an entire box of lucky charms. Mm-hmm. So I find something I see is like all these over exercising, like it's, there's this like bank, like if you overeat, then you have to exercise. But that really, again, screws with your body's response. Because Mm -hmm. when you're running or doing something you don't enjoy, you're disassociating from how that feels in your body. Yeah. It's like just crazy to me. And those people are called, those people are called compensators, right? So when you exercise and you, your body responds with hunger and cravings, it's, it's just like, okay, so you expended energy and now we want to bring energy back in. It's totally normal and common to be a compensator, but it's gotten to a point. At least for me, I couldn't manage it. Many fat people that are pursuing fat loss or weight loss or, or exercise, it's become more about earning and burning your calories mm. than it is about, okay, I'm going to train for strength. I'm going to train to build muscle. I'm going to train for performance or to feel good. Or so, yeah, there's a lot of layers to this. So I would love to dive into. Yeah. I'm sorry. I kind of, I threw, I kind of left to throw a lot of shit on the wall and see what sticks. So what's stuck? Yeah. Well, well, I'm really curious to hear more about the neuro connection mm-hmm. with nutrition, gut health. And, you, you know, the gut is so widely studied, but we still don't know that much about it. It's still just an area of, of like discovery that's still, still happening for the science. And it's said a lot of doctors when you'll, cause what happens is they're, they'll make, someone will make a big statement. Like the gut is your second brain, which is actually not true, but is true in a different way. So doctors tend to be like, Ugh, 
about the ideas of these connections because there isn't a direct connection in the way they learned in a medical school. I describe digestion as the gas guzzler of the car. So when you're in your car and you're driving and you're running low on gas, which we've all done, although I am one who, do you get to empty and then see how long you can go with the light on before you fill up? I recently just did that. My boyfriend was like just shaking his head at me. He's I like, can't. I it can't like gives me it. agita. I just can't. My husband, he'll drive my car and I'll get in it and there's the light on. And he's like, oh, it just came on. I'm like, I don't trust you. But anyway, <laughs> so when you're running low on gas, we kind of have to turn off the air conditioning of the car because that's going to create more gas guzzle. OK, I don't know if that's actually true in cars because I don't know anything about cars, but that's what I've been told. So it really works for what I'm about to say. So let's just. Even if you're a car person, don't call me out, okay? So the, uh, digestion is like one of the biggest body functions our body has to do, right? So if you have digestive issues, whether you're eating something you can't digest, like me, wheat, lactose for people, or you're eating foods that are processed, your body has to work harder to digest. Now, mm -hmm. from a brain standpoint, you ever hear people say when like they're dieting, they feel like they have brain fog or can't focus? Yes. Yeah, because your brain is not getting the nutrients it needs to function. And mm -hmm. also when your digestion is slow, like my digestion, I swear to God, I have the slowest digestion known to man because of the celiac. I am also lactose intolerant. Um, I got that from my dad, celiac from my mom. Real great combination. So what also happens there all the blood flow has to go to my digestion to get that stuff digest and get that shit out, pun intended. So again, lack of all blood flow there, lack of blood flow elsewhere. So mm -hmm. if you're, I always say to my clients, we could get super technical, but at the end of the day, I'm big on eat what works for your body. Like for MS, there's all these different diets and protocols. Dr. Terry Walls has one that she used because she has MS. There's low fat, there's high fat. And it's really important, I say to my clients, if you get overwhelmed about the type of diet you're eating, that is going to stress you more and can lead to an MS exacerbation or other neurological concerns. Uh, we, we all know that stressing about things is not great for you. So it's finding what foods that are easily digestible for you and that you enjoy. Like food is our fuel. It shouldn't be that emotional and a big to do. We eat mm -hmm. to survive. We can enjoy mm -hmm. it as well. So making mm -hmm. sure your digestion is moving and grooving. So if you have yep. a expensive car, like a BMW, you're not going to put regular gas in it. You have to put premium gas in it. So that's from one standpoint, so that our brain can function. Also, like what we were talking before, it'll affect serotonin levels and other things based off what is available to your brain and body. If you need more chemicals going to digestion, that is going to divert things away. Your thyroid might have to work more, your liver. There's basically more wear and tear on your body. Okay, so from an anxiety standpoint, somebody who is really, body's working hard to digest, that body can't focus on other things. And anxiety is, I don't want to get too far there or make any grandiose claims. But what we find neurologically is there's a lot of instability in people's upper body, shoulders in particular, spine. When your body has to support and protect joints that are not stable, it's again more work. What we find is when people can find what we call the neurostudio reflex of stability, sometimes I'll have clients in my studio that are talking faster than me, eyes all over the place, and we do some of these drills. And it literally almost seems like I injected them with Prozac or some other medication that calms them down because mm -hmm. it allowed their brain to focus. We changed the sensor okay. input. So from a digestive standpoint, same thing. If your body's focus is on digestion and that's problematic, your brain cannot focus on uh, other things, create new movement patterns, or be in a more meditative state. So it's, it's all connected. So all mm -hmm. I can offer people is to help them understand their sensory system, help them create change at their sensory system, and a thing called proprioception. All proprioception mm -hmm. is is how our where our brain is mapping our body. Most people 
have good proprioception, except it's no longer serving them and they need changes. So dancers, athletes, people who lift, we might think our body is in one place when it's actually another. So by using sensory changes, you can shift your proprioception. Now I'm going to get a little technical. Proprioception is one of the neurological determinants of balance. Okay. Balance mm -hmm. meaning not falling over. Your proprioception, your visual system, your eyes, what they take in and process, and your vestibular, your inner ear. So people want to be more balanced in a movement standpoint um, in life. Proprioception can help that. So I'm just going to repeat myself because it sounded a little technical. By changing your sensory system, it can affect your proprioception, your ability to respond to muscle contractions, muscle stretching, stomach stretching, bladder stretching, okay? All those things. And so this means challenging your body in a different way so that it has to kind of relearn new patterns. Can I, I, I love it. Can we say not, I, I just want to clarify with the challenge. It, just because sometimes people think challenge is this big to do. Challenge, instead of challenges, we're trying to bring in a sensory focus. Because if you ever heard of neuroplasticity, guys, whoever's listening, mm -hmm. is we can create new patterns and change the way our brain is. But just doing something over and over again, like I'm moving my arms back and forth. That's not going to create a lasting movement pattern unless there's a focus. So if I'm saying, I'm going to look at Laura's nose and I'm only going to move my arms as much as I can stay right in line with her nose. So my eyes are the visual focus. And now my brain is trying to organize a movement pathway. Okay. So we're mm -hmm. using sensory information so that our brain and body can shift and adjust to whatever's coming at us, whether it's right. movement, food, um, a crazy person around the corner yelling at us, all those things. At the end of the mm -hmm. day, we're teaching your body how to respond better, not react, not ignore, but respond in a calm manner. And when I say calm, okay. a normal level. Yeah. So let's use you as an example. So when you cool. realized you uh, were diagnosed with celiac disease and needed to kind of re- retrain or repattern your gut in a way you can use yourself or, or, an, or another client. Yeah. I was a little depressed. I was pretty depressed about it. Let's talk about how you, um, assess your sensories and mm -hmm. then your second step of retraining new patterns and then the proprioce proprioception. Yeah. Proprioception. Walk me through as an example. So when I got that diagnosis, I was pretty depressed about it because I was like, I don't want to have celiac. That's not what I want here. Um, and then I was talking to one of my MS clients and she said to me, not condescending, very kind. She said, I know it really sucks, but I wish there was one food I could remove from my diet to make all this go away, meaning her disease. And I said, mm -hmm. thank you for saying that because it put it in perspective. She wasn't comparing me to her. She wasn't saying, oh, I'm in worse condition than you are. She was just saying, you have something you can control. Okay. Now, what was interesting, when I stopped eating gluten, I wasn't even sold on the diagnosis, Laura. <laughs> I wanted a second opinion. But I stopped eating gluten for a week and I was visiting my mother. And if anybody has an Irish Catholic relative, they are <laughs> they don't like to talk about too many feelings or therapy. So I'm in my house with my mom and she whispered, it was just me and her, are you on medication? Like whispered it, are you on medication? And I'm like, what? She meant medication for anxiety or something like that. I go, why are you asking? Because I was curious. And she goes, no, no, no. I just, I go, no, mom, honestly, why are you asking? She's like, you just seem different. You seem just more chill. And I was like, I know. Thank you for noticing. I feel that. So how I describe kind of anxiety, because I think a lot of people assume it's one thing. I've always been like this, but it was, I didn't realize how exhausting it was to be me. Okay. So it wasn't like I was trying to be someone else or I always had this amount of energy, but there was always like a lot of talk going on in my head. Mm -hmm. So when I stopped eating gluten, this is where that gut brain connection comes in. 
it wasn't that gluten was causing my anxiety. Gluten was causing severe inflammation in my guts, which affected my hormones, all those other things, which then wreaked havoc on my brain. So there is a direct connection. So after that, I said, you know what? I don't even care if I don't have celiac, although I, I have celiac. I'm saying it out loud. I'm still like in denial, <laughs> but I'm accepting it. I'm accepting it. <laughs> um, was how I felt. So don't everybody stop eating gluten because that might not be the thing for you. I don't want people to think gluten causes anxiety. It did in me. Then from there, I was able to notice things. So for example, I didn't know the thing about the belly button until I was working out with pants that were really high. I noticed every time I wore tight, compressive pants, I was fidgeting more. People would set me off. like. I would get angry. I felt fat. Okay, you can't gain that much weight from putting on your pajamas to putting on pants. Like, that's physically impossible. But in our industry, feeling like I was in sausage casing, stuffed sausage, made me feel bad about myself. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, and every time I go to Athleta, they're like, your pants are too big. Get a smaller size. I'm like, I'm 41 years old. I know how to buy pants. So number one, I started noticing about my body and what my body needed. I also am very conscious of how my skin touched my clothes. So I use that during movement. So for example, if I'm going to lift weights and do an overhead press, for example, I feel how my skin is touching my shirt. Then I'm going to press the weight. Do it with me, Laura. Press your arms over your head and just feel how your skin feels different in your shirt. Now we... Okay. I never think about that. For me, I feel, do you feel the difference? Yeah. I never think about it. Yeah. So from there, where do you feel the increase of pressure in your shirt? Is it at your chest, your belly, your back, your sides? Yeah. My chest. Okay. So do that back. overhead press again without increasing the pressure between your skin and your shirt. Now you all can't see Laura. I can. She initiated her shoulder movement with more glenohumeral rhythm and she was more focused in the movement. But Laura, did you feel the difference in that movement? A little bit, yeah. Okay. So again, we don't have weights in our hand. Weights also give sensory feedback through our hands. Right. So that is one example of using your skin into your clothes to help your brain know where you are in space. So just a quick neurology of movement. Our brain gets sensory information in from our skin, our joints, our tendons, a lot of different places, muscle spindle, a lot of different areas, okay? That information is processed in our brain, and then our brain selects a motor output. So, for example, if Laura lifts her arms up with no weight, and then Laura lifts, grabs a 50-pound weight, Laura is going to have more muscle activation, just naturally, because her brain is responding. What happens with a lot of people is they don't get true sensory in from the weight. They just feel the weight down. Then they can't lift it. Okay. Mm. So with your clothes, we want our brain to know where our body is in space. Your brain didn't realize you were lifting your chest. Now, not to get too technical, I would have to assess, was that from your lumbar spine, your hips around your pelvis? People, our brains use what's available. So everybody has compensation patterns. It's not bad. Everybody's a different gait cycle. So I'm not going to say don't arch your back when you lift. I'm going to say don't increase the pressure in your shirt, which will hopefully, if it was a good sensory input, trigger a neurological response in your brain, hopefully your cerebellum, to create a new movement pattern. Right. So we just used your skin touching your clothes to, to ground you. Now, right now, I want you, Laura, to push your body into your clothes. Like take up space in your clothes. How does that feel? I don't like it. No, we walk around all day pulling our bodies away from our clothes. But what we're actually doing is confusing our brain because we're not actually there. We're actively pulling our bodies in. So what we're actually doing is confusing our brain. Okay, so if you're already, I use an orgasm, for example. If you're clenching your pelvic floor, can you have an orgasm? No. Men understand this. They will often clench their pelvic floor to slow down an orgasm where women clench their pelvic floor to make it feel better for a man, which also inhibits an orgasm. Okay. So if you're already contracting muscles in your brain can't create the proper motor output. So I'll often tell people, and this freaks people out. 
I'll take a picture of them when they're pulling their abs in. And then when they're just letting, maybe don't let your belly push into your shirt. Let your belly touch your shirt. And what if you don't, where it's touching your shirt the most, don't let it touch there. I'll then take a picture of them there and they're like, holy crap, I look 10 pounds lighter. Yes, because they're not sucking in, they're actually seeing their body, mm-hmm. right? So this is just one example of using skin as a sensory tool to change our bodies. And being okay, the big turning point for me is twofold. I'm going to get, I don't like to get too vulnerable, but I will. Number one, the relationship before the relationship, the guy I dated before my husband, who I thought I was going to marry. I'm so glad I didn't, but I learned a lot so that I knew I married the right person. Mm -hmm. As we dated, I had lost weight. Now I equated thin Megan with the best version of Megan. He liked me less at the end of the relationship. We broke up, but he broke up with me. Okay. Let's be honest. So I'm thinking, so he liked the girl that was 10 pounds heavier. He did not like the girl who was 15 pounds lighter. So we always equate ourselves. So that was a big turning point for me that my weight had nothing to do with who I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was number one. Then one day my stomach was hurting and I realized I'm driving in my car, holding my abs in by myself in my car. Like what would the truck driver next to me see my belly? And I kind of realized is like, I'm doing that by myself. What am I doing out in open? So, and when I can release my belly, my stomach stops hurting. Mm. Okay. So these are two examples of things we do to protect ourselves and tell us who we are, are actually inhibiting us truly being ourselves. And listen, I mentor a lot of movement teachers, business people. Most people just don't know who they are, who they want to be. Now I'm going to equate it to what you do with diet and weight loss. I find when I try to lose weight, I can't. When I'm not trying to lose weight and I'm I'm just Mm -hmm. being myself, I'll be like, did I just lose five pounds? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, so it's easy to say just be yourself, but if you're not comfortable with that for multiple reasons. And I wasn't always comfortable in my skin. I had someone reach out to me from childhood. She is a principal. She heard me on a podcast and was like, I want you to come in and do a lecture for my school. How do we like, I love this. And I kind of shared with her. I'm like, I know it's changed my life. And I was like, can you tell the difference in me? She's like, yeah, well, you've always been that way. But I, she's like, I feel like you're saying it and you mean it. Like, I feel Mm -hmm. like to find the confidence in yourself, you need to feel okay in your skin. And it's more than just telling people to feel okay in their skin. And I'm not a therapist. That's not my shtick. So I do it through movement because people Mm -hmm. like to move. They need to move. When we stop moving, I hate to say we shrivel up and die, but when you stop moving, your organs get stiff, fascia gets stiff. We dry out. Aging is a drying out process. So you Mm got to keep moving. Number Mm -hmm. one, you don't have to exercise a ton to maintain and lose weight. And if you use exercise based off your sensory load and what your brain needs, It is going to change the way you feel and look in your body. Let's talk about your origin story a bit because you didn't really start with this. You started as a Pilates instructor, correct? I still am a Pilates. I actually started a sports-specific training. Okay. My undergrad is exercise science, master's in applied physiology. I wanted to work with athletes. I got into the neuro because somebody asked me if I worked with MS. And at 24, I was arrogant and said, of course. Um, because at the time I was the only Pilates teacher with a a degree in applied physiology with masters. So a lot of PTs would refer to me. I had to Google what is MS. And I share that story because that is my actual origin story. Like it's not Mm -hmm. profound or great. Um, and then I realized there was nothing out there. They told them to stretch and I'm like, I freaking hate stretching. That gives me pain. Stretching has always been painful to me. Now, Reasons being is I didn't know how to respond to it. So anyway, I was like, I need to figure this out for people because how my brain works is I don't like bullshit answers. That's why I love what you do. I feel like there's no bullshit. You're like, this is how you create a plate. You show people how to do it rather than, oh, just get some protein. What do you like? It's like, we've heard this enough. Okay. It's not helpful. So I wanted to create that help. 
I now use these. So I set out to help people with neurological conditions, help them walk and regain their life, which I do every day. But I also work with athletes, help with people with anxiety. I love working with children and young adults with autism. Um, I have a very different approach and I explain that to parents. I am not going to make them normal and I'm putting air quotes. I am going to help them be the best version of themselves. Their brains are great. They just work different. If we can optimize that. Um, like I had a young kid in his school, they kept making him sit cross-legged on the floor and he didn't want to do it. And he would kind of have a freak out and then they would give him food to get him down on the floor. And through the movement assessment, he would kneel and he would sit in chairs. The problem was his SI joints. He was not able to differentiate his hips from his SI joints. So it created this sensory discomfort and too much of a stretch in his lower back and SI joints. So when he sat on the floor, it was too much sensory information. Mm. So he would freak out. So I said, this kid should never sit cross-legged unless he chooses. And I got a lot of pushback from that assessment. I go, why does a kid have to sit cross-legged on the floor? Why? And they're like, because the other kids do. Who cares? Like, when was the last time you sat on the floor cross-legged? Can't remember. Exactly. Now, if the parents are like, Megan, would you be able to teach him how to do this? Yes, we could. But I'm always very frank about that. And I'm when I work with clients or business, I am going to help you be the best version of you. I am not going to help you become me or anybody else. I'm very mm -hmm. upfront about that. So with my origin story is helping people become a better version of themselves and get their goals, whether it's walking, whether it's talking again, whether it's athletic performance, or it's being a running a badass business. It's kind mm -hmm. of morphed into those things, but cool. that's kind of where it came from. And I share my experience about my dietary issues and my concussions when it brings value and helps people understand because mm -hmm. every concussion and dietary issue. So people listening to this stuff, celiac, you might've had a totally different experience than me. You might love things above your belly button. So I just don't want people to think that I am making any claims that celiac creates sensory issues and all that jazz. I also mm -hmm. have always had a bad relationship with food because guess what? Even as a kid, I never felt good when I ate. I never wanted to eat. And then I would overeat. Like I just, and my dad's the same way. But my dad's just not emotional about food. He's like, ah, eh, I'll eat when right. I eat. Yeah. So yeah. I've had those things ever since I was a kid, but I thought that was just me and I'd have to deal with it. You know, there were things I could have done. Now, mm -hmm. would I have listened in my 20s or as a child? Probably not. But yeah. there's ways. I uh, did a lecture for my niece's Girl Scout troop and we had a blast and they were all totally into it. One girl was like, I can't do a push up. And we got her to do push-ups. It's just, nice. see, it's just, it's fun. So you can teach kids how to change their sensory information without being like, okay, keep your shoulder here. Don't move yeah. those distance. Like kids don't give a shit. Yeah. So how can these people work with you? Is it, can you do online training if there's people around the world uh, or is it more in person? How I'm pretty much 90% virtual post COVID. Okay. And I love that. Okay. Um, so, uh, Laura can share with you my information, the neuro studio, we have a lot of courses. So if you're a movement pro and you want to teach people how to do this, those are the courses for you. Okay. You can find that on the neurostudio.com. We have two courses, Pilates for neurological conditions, um, and advanced neuro techniques. I am going to give, we, I also have another cor course called understanding anatomy in action, which kind of explains how the body works together. It's not an anatomy course. I want to give Laura, all your listeners, $50 off for that course. Well, cool. um, Thank so you. you can give them that link that kind of helps you whatever type of movement pro you are, personal trainer Pilates that you can apply in. You're going to love it. You're going to just throw it in with clients and just start getting different results. It'll just be easier. Okay. Also, if you want to work with me one-on-one -on -one and figure out your body, you can book a private session with me. I do do neuro intensives, which are three month programs for people with a neuro condition. But what I always ask is that people sign up for an evaluation first, because sometimes people don't need that three month intensive. Mm -hmm. I've had people like, no, I want to do your three month intensive. And it's an expensive product because I'm in there with you. I said, you don't need that. Let's just do a few one on one sessions and we'll take it from there. So you can work with me one on one through my other business, the Copel method. And then the neuro studio is the teacher training. 
Um, and if you awesome. have a loved one with a neuro condition, we also have workouts and Q and A's for them, the other leg of the neuro studio and reach out, ask questions, um, comment on Instagram, um, say hello. Yeah. We'll link that below too. Well, and we'll, yeah. we'll link those. Um, there's those a lot of ways you can talk to me. And as you can tell, I like to talk. So, yeah. <laughs> I just kind winked, but nobody could see that. I kind of forgot. Yeah, I, I saw it. Does Don't a wink about. come across in vocal tone? But going with what Laura does with, I feel like that combination of understanding food and understanding your body, um, I know this sounds corny as hell. I feel like it can really change people's lives or how they view themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has yeah. personally for me and um, I still see clients every day because I love this shit. Yeah. So anything else that you want to tell our listeners about neuro connection and diet, nutrition, the gut, anything that we, I feel we like haven't I've, covered already? I feel like I don't want to, I feel like they've heard enough from me, but what I do want to say <laughs> is if something's not working for you, it's not you. It's the situation. Meaning everybody responds to sensory information differently. So waiting to feel full might not be your tool because you might not feel full or feeling full might not be the same for you and me. And I always say to people when they kind of be like, well, what is it supposed to feel like when you're stable, when you're reflexly stable? Um, I go, what does happiness feel like? It's different for every person. Okay. And we mm -hmm. often don't understand happiness until we feel sad. Right? So finding what those sensations mean to you. So if you're doing something and it's not working, if you've tried every diet, if you've, if you're really stuck in your movement or you're living with pain, there is another way because you have to base off all these techniques off how your brain uniquely responds. Mm -hmm. Maybe your visual field is limiting your movements. Maybe your lack of sensation because you have EDS, which is Ehlers-Danlos, or you're just hypermobile. Maybe you were a dancer and everybody would, um, just talk about how beautiful you're a mover because you're hypermobile, like hypermobile people, it looks beautiful on stage. So they do it more, but that can inhibit all of your sensations. So there are other tools and ways. Don't give up on yourself. There is hope and there are ways to change. I would like to wow. leave them on that. So fascinating. It's cool, right? Thank you so much for being on Megan and I will link Megan's Instagram below and her courses and you can connect with her on Instagram and over there. Thank you so much for being on Megan. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And I really enjoy chatting with you. Always a pleasure seeing you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you.